Hi everyone, welcome to my talk, Stop Reinventing Operator Wheels. This is an introduction to Controller Idioms, which is a Golang library that we wrote to make writing operators and controllers a little bit easier. My name is Evan Cordell. I'm a software engineer at AuthZ, where we're building a distributed permissions database called SpiceDB, similar to Google's Zanzibar system, if you're familiar. I did want to mention before I get too far into it that I'm going to assume some prior knowledge of Kubernetes and controllers and operators um, and Golang. So if those are not very familiar to you, you might want to check out some of the resources before you watch this. But let's just get into it. So all operators and controllers do pretty much the same types of work. They might ensure that some resource exists in a cluster with a particular configuration, maybe creating a deployment in response to some API call, making a job, making a service, um, deleting duplicates that it doesn't think need to exist. Or they might do something like wait for some condition to be present, um, waiting for a job to finish, a deployment to be fully available, a service to have endpoints, things like that. Or they might need to start watching a new resource because it's been referenced by another object uh, that it watches and it needs to start watching the new thing so it can pull down updates and update its local cache with a representation of that API. So there's these really common building blocks that we use to build operators. Those are just some examples, but we end up writing them from scratch almost every time. There's a lot of great libraries out there that help with some of the low level complexity of talking to Kubernetes and building a controller, things like controller runtime, operator SDK, kube builder. Um, but we still end up rewriting these same basic workflows over and over again, you know, create the service, you know, we, we use a client to do that, things like that. And operators are essentially state machines. They read the Kubernetes state from the API, they make some decisions based on that state, and then they do stuff based on it. What's kind of interesting about operators is that they're really, really big state machines. Uh, and I kind of think that this is what drives our lack of reuse, because when you have big state machines like this, you're often using the previous states, the previous context to make decisions about what to do. So you might decide whether or not to create an object in the kube API based on other actions the operator's already taken, based on new information it gets from events, things like that. And that can make it really difficult to reuse bits of a controller elsewhere. So that's kind of where controller idioms comes in. That's what we're trying to solve. How do we make the steps in a state machine reusable for a controller? But you might be asking why I'm talking about this, why we're talking about it now, what's going on? Uh, so. I mentioned this at the top, but we're building an open source implementation of Zanzibar called SpiceDB, if you want to check that out. Uh, to run that, we also wrote the SpiceDB operator to run it on Kubernetes, which is open source. You can look through it. And then our hosted services we call Auth Dedicated is built on top of a set of additional operators that are currently not open source. A lot of us are former CoreOS, Red Hat, and Operator Framework alum. Um, so we're familiar with operators. We really believe in their value. And they let us deliver software to our own users uh, quickly and safely. But because we were writing all these operators, we kept seeing these same patterns across all of them and trying to come up with a way to share them between all of our implementations. So that's kind of why we're doing this right now. Um, we're building lots of operators. We have experience building operators, and we want to make it simpler for ourselves and share that with others. So now we're going to actually jump into the basic idea here, which is to come up with an interface to let us break down big controllers, big state machines, and just talk about little pieces of them at a time. Um, this isn't just for the ability to reuse. It's also really helpful for things like testing um, and composition and that kind of thing. But I'm just going to start with this basic interface handle, which probably looks pretty familiar if you're familiar with Golang, because this is essentially the same as the HTTP server interface. And this is going to be our building block for making large controllers. Um, I did want to mention that this really isn't any particular framework specific. You could do this with controller runtime. You could do this with client go or SDK, whatever you're, you're using. Um, it's really kind of at a different layer than a lot of those tools work. 
So if all of our little bits of a big controller are broken down into these small handle functions, these handlers, we still need a way to pass um, context between them because we don't want to always recompute all the data that we need. We can, and um, controllers often have access to huge swaths of cache data to recompute state. Um, but it's not ideal. Ideally, we're not recomputing things all the time in every handler just to keep them decoupled for testing. Um, and so obviously, Golang has this great context package that's used everywhere. Um, but now with Golang 118, we can build some nicer abstractions around those using uh, typed accessors. So one of the things that controller idioms includes is this typed accessor library, typed context, that lets you create uh, keys that index into a context and let you pop out values of a particular kind. Um, this is not really operator specific at all, but uh, it ends up being really useful when you're writing handlers and you want to transmit values between them. So in this case, I have two handlers. One of them does some expensive computation, stashes that into a context, and then in a later handler, we extract the value back out. So it's probably not super obvious that these compose well. Um, and I would say right now they don't. I haven't gotten to that yet. Um, but you can imagine some sort of synchronization function that's calling these handlers. Um, you do step one, handler one, do step two, handler two. But one of the problems is that if, if we're using context like this to pass values between handlers, um, this second call, handler two, can't access anything that handler one added to the context because it doesn't have the value back out. Um, and since we haven't now using pointers and we're not returning the context, we can't pass handler to the context value. Um, so what we could do is we could do something like this. We could just say, okay, well, sync calls handler one and then handler one calls handler two, uh, which does work because now handler two has all the context that handler one had and can grab values back out of it. If you imagine the earlier example with some expensive computation done in handler one, now handler two can pull that back out without recomputing it. Um, but this does make it a little harder to rearrange, and it's not um, it's not super different from just having a bunch of uh, functions that are not a standard interface, right? Because it doesn't give me anything new, and I have to if I if I want to move handler two to run before handler one, I have to rearrange everything, right? So this is where the builder type comes in, which is a function that takes in a set of handlers and returns a new handler which is maybe not too exciting. But what this lets us do is uh, think about injecting the next handler that a handler calls dynamically in a way that we can rearrange uh, later. I'll search some examples so it's not as uh, nebulous. So here's an example using a function chain, which is part of controller idioms, which will uh, first run the first builder to create a handler, then run the second builder to create a handler, and it'll run the two handlers uh, in order, passing the context in between them so that they do have the, the values shared. Um, and you can imagine rearranging uh, these two. You could flip them back around and do second builders and then first builders so that the second one is called first. Uh, and I can rearrange this without rewriting either of them. Now, the only caveat there is that it, they may have different expectations around what uh, values exist in the context, depending on where they are in the chain. Um, and so that is why there's lots of helpers around ensuring that the context has what you expect it to do. And in a, in a bigger controller, it's uh, not every step in a chain will depend on every other step of the chain. So it makes it a little easier to do things like rearranging when, when needs change. So another example is the parallel helper, which does essentially the same thing as the chain function. Um, but in this case, both run in parallel with the same input context. So in this case, they don't actually aren't they aren't able to affect each other's context at all. So we kind of we fixed the problem with chain and now we've broken it again with parallel. We, we don't get the values back out of context. So I'm going to come back to how this is solved. But another way that you can compose uh, handlers is via wrapping. If I have some existing handler, I can stick it inside of another handler and call it, and then I can check and see if there's been any errors there. Now, the thing here is that the context um, that is modified by the wrapped handler isn't accessible from the wrapper, 
Uh, and so there's some helpers in the same typed context package that helps deal with this problem. Instead of uh, just putting a value in the context, uh, to start with, we put a space for the object in the context. And then when we call the wrapped handler, it fills in the space that we made, uh, which is a pointer. And then now after I've called handler, I can access the values from the handler again later. Um, so this is also how you could deal with uh, parallel values. Um, you can run both handlers in parallel, but then they can put values back into context boxes rather than contexts, and you can pull those values out when you need them. And then one other way that we can compose handlers is via branching. Uh, in this case, we have these handler keys that identify a specific handler out of a big set. So you could do something like, uh, in this example, I have a sync function that first looks at the object to decide if it's been deleted or not, and then branches into two different handler chains based on that decision. Um, so this would let me have defined elsewhere like a full chain of if it's deleted handlers versus a full chain of if it's not deleted handlers it lets me keep those things separate rather than all jumbled in one big uh, state machine essentially so there are these helpers for dealing with sets of other handlers and picking out the right one and giving them identifiers and things like that so now that we have a way to compose controllers and build them up out of smaller pieces. We can also more easily talk about you know, common patterns and encoding those with these libraries. And that's kind of what the rest of controller idioms is. The first bit is the basic building blocks to make things reusable. And the next bit is um, some actual patterns that we've identified that we've used multiple times that we think are generally useful. So the first idiom is adoption. This comes up a lot when controllers are trying to be efficient with the resources they watch. Um, so for example, you could write a controller that watches every config map in a cluster, and then when someone references a config map in an object, you will have that config map in your cache already because you're watching all config maps. Most people don't want to watch all config maps, both for like security reasons and then also just for space reasons. That means you have to have every single config map in cache in your operator to work. So instead, you when you open a watch against the cube API, you can give it a label filter, and that will only send the objects down to you that match that label. Um, but then, of course, you have a problem where if the operator is not the one creating the config map, it can't put that label on it, so it won't be in its cache. So this is an issue for any resource that is used as input to a controller rather than as output. And this is what we call the adoption workflow. when some custom resources created um, that references another object that's already existing in the cluster. We first check and see if it exists. And then if it does, we add whatever the special operator label is that the operator is watching. And that brings the object into the operator's watch stream and cache. And now the operator can know that it's there and continue working with that object going forward. Um, another one that we use a lot we call the component idiom. And this really is just when the operator is in full control over some external resource that it creates in response to user input. So a user creates a custom object and then we need to create a deployment based on that object or a service, whatever. Um, in that case, the operator is creating it and it's you know has some uniqueness property. It's one-to-one -one or many-to-one -one with the object the user created, um, generally life-cycled with it, so it might have owner references. It's really not supposed to be um, shared with other controllers. This is a, a relatively common pattern that some operators use. Um, and so we've encoded this in controller idioms as well so that uh, it will handle the kind of the dirty work of creating the object if it doesn't exist, you know, checking for changes via hashing, and then deleting duplicate objects if it's created in a way that there could be duplicates, for example. Um, this just makes it easy to make um, a controller that just ensures that a bunch of stuff exists based on some input object. Another idiom um, we're calling static resources, which is when uh, a controller is given some definition of an object and it just makes sure that object exists and matches exactly. Um, this can be really useful for bootstrapping if you have 
a controller that you know needs to create some default resources when it starts up, this can be really a, a useful way to do that. Um, could also be some sort of uh, operator global config if you have something along those lines that needs to just always exist when the operator is running. Uh, another one is the pause idiom, where it can often be useful to tell a controller not to stop entirely, but to stop processing a specific object. This can be especially useful if um, you need to go in and do some debugging, um, deal with you know human operator needs, stop it from doing something crazy, that kind of thing. We also have a self-pause uh, idiom, which is maybe not a thing that you should use um, much, if at all. That's really just for if an operator can definitely determine that it has no way to make progress on its own. Maybe it's too expensive to pull for state changes for some reason in an external system, or it's rate limited or something, um, doesn't have access to something it needs. Um, then it could self-pause the object, and that um, not only sets the uh, an annotation that will tell the controller to stop uh, watching it, but it will also add a condition to the object if you're using standard uh, conditions block on the object and report that it's paused and why and what you can do to unpause. In addition to the idioms, we also have a set of Kubernetes utilities. Um, I'll just kind of briefly go over these. I think they're um, they're really in support of everything else, but we have um, some basic caching libraries that wrap um, hashing and validating hashes. Um, there's some utilities for um, work queue management. Uh, if you're if you're using client go, um, probably not something you'd want to use if you're using controller runtime. Uh, it has some common metrics to emit. If you're using standard conditions, for example, this will emit, emit metrics based on the conditions. Um, it does come with a basic controller and controller manager implementation. Um, if you don't want to use one of the other libraries like client go or, um, or controller runtime for that, it does have a um, file informer, uh, which essentially works the same as other Kubernetes API informers, but it reads from a local file instead. Um, this can be helpful if you're um, trying to bootstrap some uh, local config or or you want to allow people to um, mount volumes into your controller and control the behavior in some way. And it also has some helpers for uh, CRD bootstrapping, um, which make use of uh, the controller runtime libraries for the same thing. Um, so that's that's kind of it. That's the the overall, that's uh, the, what the problem is. That's how we think about breaking down the problem and how we've built some abstractions to help with this uh, at AuthZ. If you want to know more, you can definitely check out the controller idioms repo, repo and uh, if you have questions or ideas um, or, you know, with still early days, if it's a lot of stuff we haven't identified that would be a great addition to the library. So if you want to add something there, I think it's, uh, it'd be a great opportunity. Um, if you want to see how controller idioms are used in practice, I have a link to the SpicyB operator here, which is open source. You can look through how we use controller idioms all over that. Um, and then if you just want to chat uh, or just get in touch, we have uh, Discord that you can come talk about it. Um, or you can get in touch on uh, Twitter. So thanks for uh, listening, and um, have a nice day.